In the last module, we discussed and explored the foundations of nuclear deterrence. This video will address theories of nuclear use. Over the course of the nuclear age, as states acquired nuclear weapons, they had to develop strategies for nuclear use that aligned with their threat perceptions and understanding of deterrence theory. They also had to communicate these policies to potential adversaries in hopes of deterring conflict and nuclear war. States wrestled with a series of difficult questions. When and how should a state use nuclear weapons? Can nuclear weapons be used or threatened against non-nuclear armed states? When considering nuclear use, what potential targets are acceptable? The choices that states make when addressing these questions have reverberating implications for a state's nuclear posture, strategy, and declaratory policy. Nuclear weapons possessors developed nuclear strategies for the production and use of nuclear weapons, as well as a plan for communicating their nuclear use strategies to other actors. Nuclear posture includes the capabilities, deployment plans, and command and control procedures that a state uses to manage and operationalize its nuclear weapons capability in order to credibly implement and support a deterrence strategy. However, for deterrence to be effective, states that possess nuclear weapons must attempt to persuade others that they have both the will and the capability to use their nuclear weapons should deterrence fail. Therefore, declaratory policy, or the statement that a government makes about when and for what purpose they might use nuclear weapons, remains a key element in deterrence discourse. That the United States would employ nuclear weapons only in extreme circumstances to defend the vital interests of the United States, allies and partners. Declaratory policy offers a kind of rules of the road for deterrence. For example, a negative security assurance is a guarantee by a nuclear weapon state that it will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state. A positive security assurance is a guarantee by a nuclear weapon state that it will come to the aid of a non-nuclear weapon state if it is attacked by another state that possesses nuclear weapons. While certain protocols to nuclear weapons free zone treaties contain negative security assurances, there's no universal legally binding treaty or resolution containing negative security assurances, despite the repeated calls for the creation of such. These positive and negative nuclear declaratory policies are designed to deter adversaries from military actions. But they also assure non-nuclear weapon states and allies they will not be subject to direct nuclear attack on their territory, and therefore dissuade them from pursuing nuclear weapons programs for themselves. Nuclear use policies must also address which potential targets are acceptable. Since the dawn of the Cold War, there have been robust debates about how to target nuclear weapons as part of a credible deterrence posture. Two major schools of thought have emerged from these debates, the counterforce and the countervalue nuclear targeting schools. Counterforce strategies target adversaries' military industrial bases, including their conventional and nuclear weapons storage and production facilities. This strategy would provide damage limitation in the event of an all-out war by eroding an adversary's ability to fight back. By focusing on military targets, counterforce strategies can also be perceived as more morally or legally legitimate. They are more likely to comport with the laws of war as they may reflect at least an attempt to consider proportionality while avoiding deliberate targeting of civilians. Some counterforce theorists envisioned the possibility of a disarming first strike, wherein one state could destroy the nuclear weapons of the other state before these weapons could be launched. Other counterforce strategists believed that limited nuclear use against military targets could result in a nuclear war that could be more controllable or lead to a political resolution short of an all-out nuclear exchange. Counterforce nuclear strategies generally require a larger and more diverse nuclear force to target hardened or mobile military assets effectively. These weapons must be precise, and they may require lower yield warheads. 
counter value targeting strategies are designed to hold civilian populations and large cities at risk with nuclear weapons. The logic of this strategy is that an adversary highly values their cities and population centers, and therefore they will be more deterred if they know these are at risk. Such a strategy can rely on a smaller, less diverse, and less precise arsenal of higher yield weapons to meet its deterrence objectives. Counter value targeting can enable smaller arsenals that may favor overall arms control reductions, but it does raise complex legal and ethical questions regarding the deliberate targeting of civilians and the rejection of proportionality as a guiding principle of lawful warfare. In addition to these theories of nuclear use, Nuclear planners have developed operational strategies for the use of nuclear weapons in a conflict. Central to many of these strategies of nuclear use are two core components of nuclear weapons use. First strike and secure second strike. Namely, the ability to maintain a nuclear arsenal sufficiently large and distributed that it can survive a nuclear attack and still unleash a devastating response. Let us turn to the evolution of nuclear use in practice, starting from 1948. In September of 1948, amid the first Berlin blockade, the U.S. National Security Council approved a document titled United States Policy on Atomic Weapons. This policy stated that the, quote, national military establishment must be ready to utilize promptly and effectively all appropriate means available including atomic weapons, in the interest of national security, and must therefore plan accordingly. One year later, on August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union conducted its first nuclear test, ending four years of U.S. nuclear primacy. The test sent shockwaves through the U.S. government and created a need to communicate national strategy to avert a war between two nuclear-armed nations. A February 1950 Joint Chiefs of Staff report on the implications of Soviet possession of atomic weapons concluded that, quote, a tremendous military advantage would be gained by the power that struck first and succeeded in carrying through an effective first strike. The Soviet Union's first test forced the United States defense community to rethink the role of nuclear weapons. The Joint Chiefs of Staff began thinking about ways to reduce or blunt the impact of a Soviet nuclear attack. The concept of counterforce targeting emerged as the United States began planning to attack Soviet conventional and nuclear weapons before they could launch, disarming the adversary. However, by the mid-1950s, the Soviet Union had amassed a sizable arsenal, and it became increasingly clear that a disarming first strike would be nearly impossible. In an attempt to counter the first strike advantage, the United States policy of massive retaliation, first announced on January 12, 1954, by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, formed the initial basis of deterrence policy and posture. Eisenhower's The New Look approach relied heavily on developing a massive retaliation strategy, which emphasized a devastating assault with nuclear weapons to counter Soviet military provocations. The aim of massive retaliation is to deter another state from any type of attack, since even a minor conventional attack on a nuclear state could conceivably result in all-out nuclear retaliation. By asserting that any nuclear use would lead to massive or all-out nuclear war, the states believed that deterrence could be maximized and attacks could be prevented. Should such an atomic attack be launched against the United States, our reactions would be swift and resolute. But for me to say that the defense capabilities of the United States are such that they could inflict terrible losses upon an aggressor, for me to say that the retaliation capabilities of the United States are so great that such an aggressor's land would be laid waste, all this, while fact is not the true expression of the purpose and the hope of the United States. Massive retaliation was challenged by scholars such as Bernard Brody, 
who argued in 1959 that massive retaliation was only credible when responding to a massive attack. He and other strategists believed deterrence needed to credibly address smaller acts of aggression, including aggression that was not directed specifically at the United States, but rather toward European allies. In 1960, President Kennedy campaigned and won against Eisenhower's vice president, Richard Nixon, arguing that Eisenhower had allowed the Soviet Union to erode the U.S. strategic superiority. They made a breakthrough in missiles. And by 1961, two and three, they will be outnumbering us in missiles. The launch of Sputnik and alleged Soviet advances in ICBM technologies had led Kennedy to believe there was a, quote, missile gap, and the Soviets had developed more robust ballistic missiles than the United States. In 1961, the United States officially adopted the national security posture of flexible response, which emphasized the creation of a wider range of nuclear options. Flexible response was also viewed as more credible than massive retaliation because flexible response gave the president more options in a strategic conflict, including conventional weapons, non-military options, and a range of nuclear responses as a means of managing nuclear crises. The United States and the Soviet Union did not have the nuclear club to themselves for long. The Soviet test of 1949 was quickly followed by the United Kingdom's first nuclear test in 1952, France's first test in 1960, and China's first nuclear test in 1964. According to Avner Cohen, Israel developed its initial nuclear capability in 1966 or 1967. These changes brought multi-actor dynamics into deterrence theory and complicated the nature of international relations. The United Kingdom's nuclear ambitions were driven largely by fear of the Soviet Union's larger conventional forces and by doubts of U.S. commitment to European defense after the Soviet Union developed atomic weapons in 1949. In 1950, a British Chief of Staff Subcommittee on Air Defense stated, quote, when New York is vulnerable to attack, the United States will not use her strategic weapon in defense of London. The United Kingdom must, therefore, have its own retaliatory defense. By 1960, the V-Bomber Force was the United Kingdom's main contribution to the nuclear deterrence power of the West. Following France's 1960 nuclear test, General Pierre-Marie Galois, a prominent French nuclear strategist, argued that the U.S. shift from massive retaliation to flexible response meant a weakening of the American commitment to defend France with nuclear weapons. In his book, Strategy in the Nuclear Age, Galois popularized deterrence of the strong by the weak, a logical foundation of French Cold War nuclear strategy which stressed the equalizing power of nuclear weapons for smaller states. French President Charles de Gaulle emphasized that the French nuclear arsenal should be led by a tous-azimut strategy. The central goal of the early French nuclear arsenal was to not target any one adversary in particular, but to be able to strike anywhere. After its 1964 nuclear test, the People's Republic of China put out an official statement calling nuclear weapons a, quote, paper tiger, and declaring that China would, quote, never at any time or under any circumstances be the first to use nuclear weapons. While China's no first use policy has remained since 1964, the United States and its allies have consistently questioned the veracity of China's no first use policy. Israel's nuclear weapons program has been characterized by ambiguity from the start. In a 1969 declassified memo to President Richard Nixon, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger leveraged a sale of Phantom aircraft to Israel in exchange for a promise, quote, not to be the first to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. Israel interpreted introduce 
to mean they would not test, deploy, or publicly display their nuclear arsenal. Since then, Israel has maintained a policy of ambiguity towards its possession of nuclear weapons. Throughout the Cold War, the United States nuclear policy adapted to meet Soviet challenges. One of these notable changes is the adoption of the Schlesinger Doctrine. Under the guidance of Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, the Nixon administration pursued a rethinking of U.S. nuclear targeting. Historian Lawrence Friedman notes that this new doctrine emphasized the creation of two new types of options, one that provided limited strikes using only a few nuclear weapons, and one that emphasized destroying the Soviet Union's ability to economically recover. While the United States policies adapted to meet the challenges put forward by the Soviet Union, the nuclear landscape became increasingly complicated in the later years of the Cold War and the immediate post-Cold War years as well. In the wake of China's nuclear test, the United States became increasingly concerned about the unrestrained spread of nuclear weapons. A confluence of factors, including the fear of proliferation, allowed U.S. leaders to openly discuss the possibility of working with the Soviets to prevent more countries from going nuclear. By 1970, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty had entered into force. After nearly a quarter of a century of danger and fear, reason and sanity have prevailed to reduce the danger and to greatly lessen the fear. In 1972, India conducted its first nuclear test, named Smiling Buddha. In the aftermath, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs characterized the test as a, quote, peaceful nuclear explosion. While India maintained a high level of ambiguity around its nuclear capabilities, Pakistan quickly initiated an effort to follow suit. In 1998, India tested five more nuclear weapons and cemented its intentions to be a nuclear-armed state. In 2003, India adopted a conditional no-first-use policy. Eleven days after India's 1998 nuclear test, Pakistan began a series of six nuclear tests. The nuclear program was greatly aided by a Pakistani physicist named A.Q. Khan, who later ran a global proliferation network that is suspected of having supplied Iran, Libya, and North Korea with nuclear knowledge. Since 1998, Pakistan's nuclear weapons program has largely remained India-centric. Pakistan originally maintained a credible minimum deterrence strategy. However, in 2011, after testing a tactical Nasser nuclear weapon, Pakistan announced in a press release that its strategic deterrence capability could respond at, quote, all levels of the threat spectrum. Some see this as a shift away from credible minimum deterrence and toward a more full-spectrum deterrent. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea is the newest member of the nuclear club. Since 2006, North Korea has tested six nuclear weapons and hundreds of long-range ballistic missiles. In 2017, North Korea tested the Hwasong-15 ICBM, which many analysts assume is capable of hitting large portions of the continental United States. During a military parade in 2020, North Korea unveiled an even larger ICBM. While North Korea's nuclear weapons policy and doctrine are ambiguous, it is clear that North Korea developed a nuclear arsenal to deter the United States. In a New Year's Day message in 2018, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said, quote, The entire United States is within range of our nuclear weapons, and a nuclear button is always on my desk. Today, the nuclear armed states have a variety of different nuclear capabilities, strategies, and doctrines. While some of these nuclear policies have adapted and changed over time, many are remnants of the Cold War 
and the immediate post-Cold War era. Nuclear strategists today are figuring out how to best posture nuclear weapons and communicate their intended uses to best deter against new and emerging threats, including the rise of multipolar great power competition, cross-domain warfare, and the spread of cyber and space capabilities. To unpack these challenges, we've asked Heather Williams and Vipin Narang from MIT to provide further insights. We'll begin by returning to the distinctions between nuclear policy, doctrine, and strategy. So I'd say at the highest level, a state decides to acquire nuclear weapons uh, and then has to think about its nuclear strategy. And nuclear strategy, I think, is the highest level decision a state has to make with respect to its nuclear weapons. What is a state trying to achieve with its nuclear weapons? Who is the state trying to deter? What actions is the state trying to deter? And that leads to a bucket of potential nuclear strategies, right? So a state could say, I'm trying to deter a conventional attack against me, and so I need to retain the option and develop the capabilities to threaten nuclear first use against a conventional attack. Other states may say, you know, I'm conventionally strong enough that I don't need to deter a conventional attack with the use of nuclear weapons. I really want to use my nuclear weapons to deter nuclear use and coercion against me. And that leads to a different strategy and theory of, you know, the purpose of nuclear weapons. And it also leads to then a different nuclear posture, right? Then the focus is on survivable second strike forces, the ability to deliver overwhelming retaliation with nuclear forces. And that state doesn't necessarily need to invest in battlefield nuclear weapons that might make the threat of first use in a conventional attack credible. And so a state starts with its nuclear strategy and then has to choose the nuclear posture to implement that strategy. What are the capabilities and the investments that I need to make in terms of the types of nuclear weapons I develop, the delivery systems, the deployment modes, the command and control. And all of those are broadly kind of categorized as nuclear posture. And then we have doctrine. And the doctrine is gonna be the overarching plans and the guidelines here. To try to help understand this, I actually like to use a football, American football analogy. So you can think of doctrine as the rules of the game. These are the rules that your team is going to play by. Posture is the makeup of your team. Who's the quarterback, right? Who's the center? And you release that beforehand. It's the players, the lineup. Declaratory policy would be if the coach went on ESPN and said, here is our plan for victory, such as saying defense wins Super Bowls and kind of indicating and communicating, here's what our priorities are. And here's where we are really trying to invest our resources and our efforts. So posture is the makeup and that's gonna be informed by different um, strategic and security priorities. Uh, the doctrine is your game plan or the guidelines. And the declaratory policy is one, but a very important message about when you would or would not be using those nuclear weapons. Having outlined the different options available to states Let's explore why they might choose one over another. Do some policies deter conflict better than others? Some nuclear postures do deter conflicts better than others. Those are the nuclear postures that are tailored to a specific adversary or a threat. They're gonna be better at deterrence than others. Let's go back to some first principles here about what deterrence is and why some postures are better than others. Deterrence is about the three C's. This is kind of the classic description of deterrence strategy. The first of the three C's is capability. Do you have the forces to do what you're threatening to do? Or for example, my defenses like inhibit your ability to do this. Are your systems up to speed? Are they aging? Are they old? And so that is really kind of the core of the first of the C's capability. The second C is credibility. Will you actually go through with what you are threatening to do? This is a huge question for nuclear deterrence because nuclear deterrence is threatening to kill hundreds of thousands of people, typically. You are talking about potentially a massive humanitarian disaster, ecological impacts, agricultural impacts, not just the security or the geopolitical environment. Under what circumstances would you actually go through with that and do what you are threatening? So credibility is a really important component of deterrence that you'll follow through with a threat. And then the third C is communication. Have you made it clear to an adversary 
what will befall them if they take this action against you. Have you laid out for them, these are the conditions under which we will use nuclear weapons, so those positive assurances. This is where the tailoring is really important. How you deter Kim Jong-un is going to be different from how you deter Vladimir Putin. There's a really strong psychological component to deterrence. You have to think about how your actions will be perceived by the adversary, not just how they'll be perceived by you. So there's this question about whether a no first use policy um, or declaration can be made credible. And several states have no first use policies, China and India being two of them. The United States avowedly does not have a no first use policy. It retains the options to use nuclear weapons first. This was designed to make the threat of first use against a conventional conflict, essentially in Europe against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact credible. But there are long and lingering questions about whether a no first use declaration from by China or India can be made credible because a declaration when push comes to shove in a conflict does not physically prevent a state from using nuclear weapons first. And this is the criticism of no first use policies. And there are many in the U.S. military and in Washington who do not believe that China's no first use declaration is credible, that in an intense conflict, nothing would prevent China from using nuclear weapons first. And the concern is actually uniquely for the United States that our allies might actually be concerned by a no first use policy because what makes extended deterrence work for our allies to reassure our allies is the U.S. retention of the threat to use nuclear weapons first if there's a conventional attack on behalf of our allies. So it's a huge reassurance piece. There are some potential benefits to doctrines of no first use or sole purpose. But first, let's talk about the difference between those. Uh, so sole purpose and no first use are often used interchangeably, but they are pretty different. Sole purpose is more of a doctrine. So remember, this is your game plan if you're a football team. This is saying the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter. You are outlining the rules by which you are viewing all of this. No first use is a declaratory policy and is a negative security assurance. And it is saying very clearly, here is a very explicit rule that we are living by. Sole purpose can be perceived as a bit more vague. It's somewhat more flexible, arguably. Some of the potential gains of sole purpose statements or also no first use might be potentially risk reduction. So if you're in the middle of a crisis and you've told your adversary, we only view nuclear weapons as a deterrent, we would not use them first, this might avoid nuclear escalation if your adversary believes it. And it may achieve the purpose of signaling, you know, a reduction in the salience of nuclear weapons in, in policy. If the United States could convince its allies that sole purpose is a philosophical statement and not an employment constraint, if push comes to shove for their security, their existential security, then there may be an ability to kind of square the circle where sole purpose declaration can have the signaling purposes and benefits to the adversaries in the international community without the attended downsides that a no first use declaration would. So uh, it's possible. I mean, it, the, the allies may still not believe it, but I think there is enough daylight between sole purpose and no first use that it's worth making the argument that maybe sole purpose is just short of a no first use declaration, but achieves a lot of the benefits. In the 21st century, deterrence strategies face numerous emerging challenges. In my opinion, the greatest challenge for deterrence in the future is going to be communication. Communicating deterrence messages is becoming a lot more complicated. It's complicated by disinformation, misinformation campaigns, but also signaling. Signaling has always been a real challenge, and there's some great academic scholarship on why that is. If you think you're sending one signal, doesn't mean that's what the other side is hearing. That becomes so much more complicated when you have more sources of signaling, right? So you've got the president's tweets, you have a statement coming out of the Department of Defense, you have negotiations with the State Department, you have local officials, you have other officials. Signaling also happens through hardware, it's not just software. What are you doing with your forces? How are you investing in modernization? Which capabilities are you investing in? And so trying to interpret all of those is just getting a lot harder. So in terms of strengthening nuclear deterrence, responding to new security challenges, the old playbooks are still relevant, which is one, we want to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and keep the number of nuclear weapon states limited so that we don't introduce more complexity in the system with more nuclear weapons powers. For existing nuclear weapons powers, 
I think the conversation needs to move away from eliminating nuclear weapons, which I don't think will happen in our lifetime, may not even be a good idea, but to thinking about deterrence with smaller numbers, right? So how do we reintroduce the concept of arms control to limit vertical proliferation and keep the nuclear weapons arsenals of existing nuclear weapons powers limited and capped? New and emerging challenges are constantly testing the assumptions of deterrence theory. Studying and understanding deterrence remains essential, however, for students and professionals who are engaged with global security. The final module of Deterrence 101 will further analyze how these foundational ideas of deterrence hold up in the real world. We hope you'll join us.